Hello, and a very warm welcome to our second ever virtual patient and carer information day. But thank you if you are logged in from home, many of you with a loved one, hopefully with a hot cup of tea, or one of the 40 patients and carers watching together from Aintree Hospital. I'm Louise Wright, Chief Executive at Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis, and I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Lisa Spencer. We're going to introduce the day for you and let you know how it's gonna run. This year, our event has been brought to you by a tremendous team effort. Originally started as a collaboration between Dr. Peter George and Professor Sujail Desai from the Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospitals and ourselves at Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis last year. And this year, leading the way is Dr. Lisa Spencer and ILD specialist nurse matron, Sarah Agnew from Aintree Hospital. The expert speakers today include patients and carers, prof professors, doctors, nurses, and physiotherapists from across Liverpool and beyond, who are all giving their time for free. I mention this not for sympathy, but as a demonstration of their commitment to their profession, to their patients, and to their peers. At Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis, we really understand how devastating and lonely it is to receive a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis. And that's why the Virtual Patient and Carer Day was set up originally through COVID, not only to bring you vital information, but a sense of connection and hope. The day will be recorded, so if you take a break, you'll find a recording on the APF website, but not until early November. There is a hashtag, so if you're on social media, it's PF Patient Day 2022. Please do share so more people can find the information they need. Lisa, over to you. Thank you, Louise. Uh, good morning to you, and it is lovely to see you again. And a big hello from Liverpool to all our participants out there. It's great to have you on with us today, and uh, we hope you have a great day with us. And a special hello to all our patients at Aintree. We've got a small number of on-site patients here at Aintree Hospital Liverpool who are watching this streamed live from, from one of our um, conference rooms. So good morning to you guys. A lot of those are my patients that are here on site. I'm hoping to pop over and see you later. So... I think it would be useful probably just for me to quickly outline how the day is going to run today. So the day is split into four different sessions, uh, two before lunch and two after lunch. Uh, most of the sessions are an hour long, apart from the one after lunch, which is a little bit longer. So we're gonna start the day with a session that's going to describe to you and take you through all the tests that you might undergo if you're being investigated for pulmonary fibrosis. And we've got a great uh, set of speakers for you and experts to take you through uh, th those tests and what they might mean. After that, we're going to whiz down to London and we're going to join the team in London at the Royal Brompton Hospital. And um, we've got uh, a first a, a short talk from Professor Athel Wells. And then after that, we're almost going to take you into a fly on the wall documentary and we're going to join uh, a mocked up, uh, what we call a multi-professional interstitial lung disease meeting. And, and this is the beating heart really of the service where the healthcare professionals get together, look at all your results and try and come up with a diagnosis uh, and, a, and the best management plan for the patients. And we're gonna mock that up for you and you're gonna see the conversations and how we look at the tests and how we work out what to do. Uh, then we're gonna have a, a lunch break and then in the afternoon, we'll come back to a session on treatment for interstitial lung disease. And that we're coming back to Merseyside for that session. Uh, then we'll have a short break, 10 minute break. And then we'll go into our patient's calling session where Matron Sarah will have a live round the table discussion with some patients and a carer. Uh, it'll be a very open and frank discussion, I think, about living with pulmonary fibrosis and perhaps some strategies about how to manage that. So I think that'll be a really fantastic session. And then at the end, Louise and I will do a, a brief a brief wrap up session. I forgot to mention in the morning between the first two sessions in the morning, there is also a short 10 minute break for you to go and get uh, a cup of tea and have a comfort break. So during the day, we very happy to take questions from you as we go and we will do our best as we go to answer those questions any questions that we don't get round to today we will 
answer them later and get them back to you because we might not be able to uh, answer them all immediately, but we will come back to you with answers after the event. Please can I ask you to use the Q&A box, the question and answer box to ask, ask your questions. And please don't use the chat box because that will not be monitored. So if questions go in there, we won't be able to see them and answer them for you. So use the Q&A box to ask your questions and we'll, we'll promise we'll do our best to get, get back to you uh, during the day if we, ca if we can. Um, I think that's probably most of the housekeeping stuff and a little bit of an overview. Louise, is there anything else you want me to add there or shall we move on and shall I introduce the first session? No, I think you've got it covered, Lisa. Okay, so we hope you're going to have a fantastic day with us today and I will now introduce the first session and the first session uh, is about these tests and it's a pleasure for me really to introduce our chair for this session, Dr. Aravan Poniswamy, who is a very good uh, colleague of us, a lung consultant, works in Chester Hospital uh, in Merseyside, and he's going to chair this session for us. Um, Aravan uh, runs the ILD service there at Chester with colleagues and also has a number of important roles at the university, but he's going to take us through this session this morning now, and I'm going to hand over to him. Over to you, Aravan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, Emma, and Luis, and a huge welcome to all the delegates. So the first session is going to be describing an important aspect of a journey uh, a pulmonary fibrosis patient has to go through, tests and investigations. Doctors use a variety of tests when you see them in the clinic. They can be tests to confirm the diagnosis of lung fibrosis. They can also be tests to uh, find a cause for the lung fibrosis. Can we have the first slide on that, uh, Craig? Yes, thank you. Uh, there are also tests to ascertain how severe the lung fibrosis and finally tests to monitor the disease as you come back and be reviewed in the clinic. To just Next slide, please. To just to name a few tests, there are blood tests that you are all aware of, scans and x-rays, imaging tests, there are breathing tests that you all have probably gone through. And some of you may also have had bronchoscopy, which is a camera into the lungs, and a biopsy test, which is a pinching a, tip, a small part of the lung tissue through either open chest surgery or through a camera test or through an imaging test like a CT. There are also some supplementary tests that you may have to go through to assess for complications or coexisting conditions. So with that background in mind, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Angela Key. Dr. Key uh, is completed a degree in 2003 and since then variety, uh, done a variety of roles in respiratory medicine. She started off with clinical trials in Manchester and completed a PhD looking specifically for uh, IPF patients and how they can be assessed. Since 2009, she's also been the deputy head of the respiratory department in the Aintree Hospital and has a, a lot of academic research and is currently teaching medical students at Edgehill University. Over to you, Dr. Key. Hi, uh, many thanks. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about what these blowing tests are all about. Um, so... I'm going to start off with talking to you about why do we measure, um, why do we want to measure how your lungs are working. So to start out with, we want these breathing tests because they help with the diagnosis. They come together with a lot of other information to help put things together for you. Um, with the lungs, with the breathing tests, all different lung diseases have slightly different patterns. So we're looking what pattern your breathing tests have and um, we'll pass that along to the doctors. The next thing we do is we continue to monitor you sometimes to help monitor any changes that happen within your breathing tests. So if you say to the doctor you feel a little bit better or a little bit worse, then we're able to pop some numbers to go alongside that so the doctors can see that information. Um, lung function also helps to see when you might be suitable for treatment. And I know you're going to run into nintenanib and perfenidone a little bit later on. Um, but also, if some of the values of your lungs can be a little bit, a little bit um, different, this can help us to find when it's appropriate to send you to, to see the oxygen nurses. Or um, it helps when we need to send you through, um, possibly to see the lung transplant team. If you're on medication, we continue to measure your lung function as well, just to see if there's any changes as well. 
and the last reason is that um, there can be the um, clinical trials that you might be suitable for so your lung function might help for those so I'm just going to run through the tests what we do why we do them the main breathing tests we do is something called spirometry and I'm sure this is one that um, everybody will be familiar with and this is when the person doing your test says keep going keep going and keep going I'm afraid so what we want to measure on this test is we want to measure something called your FEV1 which is how much air you can get out in one second and then we want you to keep it going because we want to measure how much air you can get out in total um, so that's why we ask you to blow as hard as you can for as long as you can it is a technique and it does take practice hopefully once you've done it um, once or twice we'll be able to get some some reproducible tests we just want to get nice reliable tests that show what is really going on within your lungs just bear in mind when you come to us the first visit you do with us will be the hardest one because the next time you come you actually um pa patients tend to have a little bit bit of a better idea of what we're going to ask you to do so um hopefully they'll find you'll find it a little bit easier um the next time you come to us just going to show you a trace of um, the spirometry so you can see there's something there that looks a little bit like a mountain when you blow as hard as you can we should get that nice peak um, on your test and as you move towards the right um, you can see the green arrow there most patients stop um, at when it feels very uncomfortable um, so that's why we ask you to keep going okay it's there is always a little bit more air out left just to come out we know it feels uncomfortable but we want to get the best results for you and the most reliable ones for your diagnosis the next test i ask patients to do is something called a slow vital capacity so this is where i'd ask you to do normal breathing then i'd ask you to do the biggest breath in you possibly could and then it's more like a relaxed sigh, like you're fed up. But again, we're gonna ask you to keep it going until you're absolutely empty and squeeze all that air out. The reason we do this test is because patients generally can get more air out doing a relaxed test rather than a blasting out test and blowing hard. So we wanna see how much more air you can get out doing this test. And again, it's all about looking at these patterns and um, looking at different, different reasons. Um, it's all about these patterns for your lung function. And this test, the slow vital capacity, then goes into our next set of tests, which is the lung volumes test. So with the lung volumes test, there's three different ways that we can measure lung volumes. Each lab will have a different way of measuring it throughout the country, just depending what equipment they have. Two of these tests are nice, relaxed breathing on the mouthpiece, and you'll be on there for a couple of minutes with these tests. And they're called helium dilution or nitrogen washout. The, la the other method that could be used to look at the volumes in your chest um, is the picture on the left there, which is a body box which is just doing breathing maneuvers inside that box and that will help us to look at your lung volumes i'm just going to show you a little picture of the lung volumes so you can see what it is we want to measure so if you can see on the left there is total lung capacity <clears throat> and if you can see down at the bottom there is a little part there called residual volume so these are these are some of the things that we want to measure so your residual volume is basically when you've emptied your lungs and you've squeezed every last little bit out for us, there is always a little bit of air left within your lungs. So we want to measure how much air is left within your lungs. And again, it's about looking at these patterns within your breathing tests. So patients with fibrosis will have certain patterns that their lung volumes will have. The last test we ask you to do is something called a gas transfer test. 
And this is a way of us estimating how well your lungs would take oxygen from the air and get it into your bloodstream. So with this one, we set the equipment up. We've got a gas with a known amount, and it's a very tiny little amount of carbon monoxide in it. We ask you to take the biggest breath in um, of this, and then we ask it to hold it inside your lungs for 10 seconds. And then we measure what you breathe back out. So we've got a small amount of carbon monoxide. We ask you to breathe in. We know how long you hold it inside your lungs for. And then we see how much of this carbon monoxide then comes out. And what that gives us an idea of is how well your lungs are able to get that gas into your bloodstream, which is really important. So what do we send through to your doctor? So for every single patient, we have a set of predicted values. So these are what we would expect your lungs to be able to do. Um, and these are based on your age, your height, your gender and your ethnicity. Um, so what we do is we prepare a report with um, a lot of different things on it, um, but we put your measured values against what we think you should be able to do, so your predicted values, and that gives us a percentage of what we think you should do. And again, it just goes back to that pattern recognition and looking um, to see how your lungs are doing as well. So what happens if you struggle and you can't do these tests? Um, all of these tests are very much technique dependent. We are here to help you and to guide you through the tests. If you do struggle with the spirometry, which tends to be the one that uh, seems to be quite a struggle because it does involve um, quite a lot of coordination and using your muscles and it's, it's quite hard work to get it right. Um, but if you can't do that one, then we can use the gentle one because patients tend to find the relaxed, slow vital capacity a little bit easier to do. Um, all patients that we see have a cough generally. So if you do cough during the test, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be a bad test. We will just have to try to work with you with that and try and try and help you with that. Um, if you really do, if you struggle to do these tests, it also might be worth bringing you back. If you see a different person with a different explanation, sometimes um, that helps patients to understand and to get to get to grips with what we're asking you to do, because we know it's not easy. Um, with particularly the patients with fibrosis, um, taking big breaths in can trigger patients to start coughing. Um, sometimes taking the big breaths in a little bit slower can help reduce the amount of cough. So we might just talk you through doing things slightly differently um, to try and get the best results for you. And always, uh, all the tests we do are actually, we measure all of it through your mouth. So it can dry your mouth and dry your airways. So little sips of water can sometimes help. So I always advise just bring, bring something with you or ask for water when you're there. Um, unfortunately, there's no other way we can measure your lungs at the moment, um, but technology does continue to move on and um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to find um, something that is, is easier and, less, um, and not as hard for you to do um, and better ways for measuring how your lungs are doing. So thank you very much for listening and I can see there's some questions I shall um, have a have a look through those. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Angela. Uh, uh, without uh, further delay, in order that we can answer enough questions, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. Um, please do put your questions, and uh, the special the specialist will be answering these questions. Um, Dr. Erica Thwait uh, is going to be our next speaker. Dr. Thwait is a radiology consultant who deals with scans and x-rays. She's been working at the Liverpool University Hospital with over 20 years of experience, and she has a special interest in lungs and lung fibrosis as such. Dr. Thwait forms an important part of our MDT, multidisciplinary team meeting, where uh, your x-rays and scans are all discussed uh, along with the specialists. Um, 
So without further delay, can I invite Dr. Thwait into the uh, uh, talk, please? Thanks, Aravind. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, this will be a, just a quick 10 minute fly through uh, chest X-rays and CT scans. So first of all, chest X-rays. Most chest X-rays are taken with the patient standing up in front of an X-ray detector and the X-rays travel through your body and the image is formed on the detector in front of it. So patients are asked to take a deep breath in in order to expand your lungs as much as possible. And chest X-rays show different structures as different densities. So your lungs look very black because they contain mostly air apart from some blood vessels that run through. Soft tissues such as your heart look whiter and then your bones are even whiter still. The arrow um, points to a structure called your diaphragm and that's a big muscle that separates your chest from your abdomen. So on the left, the chest X-ray, um, you can see the lung looks very black because the, very, the, the structures that make up your lung are very, very fine structures and they're so thin that they, they can't normally be seen on a chest X-ray. And your lungs are made up of very thin um, air sacs. When um, processes affect the lungs and the amount of air is reduced, the space is taken up by something else. And in the case of fibrosis, um, that extra material sits around the air sacs and you can see that as a whiter density. So you can see the X-ray on the right looks whiter than the one on the left. And this is a patient with pulmonary fibrosis, uh, mostly affecting the bottom half of their lungs. So a chest X-ray is a good first line test um, to make an initial diagnosis and assessment. Um, chest X-rays can also help us make a diagnosis by looking at the different patterns and the distribution of the abnormal shadowing. So on the right, this patient has IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And this causes the white lines and extra changes in the lower lungs. Whereas on the left, the chest X-ray um, is of a patient with a condition called sarcoidosis. And this cha causes changes higher up around the middle um, and the center of the lungs. And there are some other features on chest X-rays that can help us decide if someone is more likely to be at risk of developing an interstitial lung disease such as calcified pleural plaques, and I've just arrowed a few of these here. They look like very thin white lines because they're made out of calcium and they're generally easiest to see on um, the top of somebody's diaphragm. So as well as making a diagnosis, we also use chest x-rays to monitor disease progress. Um, as the amount of lung shadowing increases, uh, the volume tends to reduce and that often follows the patient's symptoms and their blowing tests. So I've just highlighted here a, a series of three chest x-rays over a number of years. The red line shows the position of the diaphragm and where it started and as, it, as it's gradually moved up over the years as the degree of whiter shadowing and fibrosis has progressed. So although chest x-ray is a good first line, um, we often move on to a CT scan because that will help detect early disease that may not be seen. And it can also help define the pattern of changes in the lungs. So when we do uh, CT scans for interstitial lung disease, they're called high resolution CT scans. And that this is because uh, we take very, very thin cuts through the lung, about one millimeter thick, and this gives us the finest detail possible. So for a CT scan, you, you're lying down, you lie down on a table, and that moves you through a donut shaped X-ray machine. The scan itself takes about five to 10 minutes, and you don't need an injection of dye. 
And for a full CT, you'll be asked to hold your breath in while the CT takes the scans. So this is um, what a typical image would look like. And again, similar to the chest X-ray, the lungs look mostly black. <clears throat> we also take some extra scans and that can give us some extra useful information, especially when we're making a new diagnosis. So we take some uh, scans with you breathing out called expiratory scans. And this is to look for areas of lung that don't or can't deflate. And we also uh, take some prone scans and that's where we ask you to turn over and lie on your front. And these can help with subtle changes, which um, can be due to mild fibrosis or can be due to gravity effect on the lungs. So it helps us differentiate between the two. Don't worry if you're not able to lie on your tummy because I know it can be difficult for some patients. We can um, generally work things out just with, a, a, with you lying on your back if absolutely necessary. But by evaluating those three scans, we can usually help define the pattern of the interstitial lung disease. And we also use CT scans to monitor the progress of your disease as well. So when the radiologist looks at the scans, they're looking at the pattern and by defining the pattern along with your clinical features, we can normally come up with a, uh, a suggested diagnosis. So looking at some of the commoner patterns, um, this is something called honeycombing and the clues in the name really. These are, these are small rounded areas of fibrosis that resemble the appearance of honeycombing and they tend to sit right at the edge of the lungs and they tend to progress over time. So if you look at the small collection of images on the right over a number of years, the, the size and number of these little honeycomb cysts has progressed. And we see this honeycombing in patients with IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and in lots of other conditions, conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial lung disease. Another pattern we look for is called ground glass. And this is, um, has a different quality. It's hazy and it looks sort of mid gray. And this can be seen on the edges of lungs, for example, in inflammatory conditions, such as myositis associated ILD, or in some connective tissue diseases as well. Now, these same conditions can, can either give an inflammatory process on the left, which is the ground glass, or they can lead to fibrosis, which is the image on the right. Um, and it's normally in the same distribution at the bottom and the edges of the lungs. So that pattern can be helpful for your clinical doctors. If, if, the, patient, if the scan shows inflammation, uh, that would indicate one type of treatment type, which may include anti-inflammatories. Whereas if the pattern shows fibrosis, then your doctor may be discussing antifibrotic um, medicines with you. Um, this is another condition called hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which also shows ground glass shadowing and fibrosis. So it can either present with, with an inflammation of the lungs where the lungs look very gray. And in that little blue box, I've just put some normal lung to show you how black normal lung should be compared to the, the sort of hazy gray of the inflamed lung. Um, this process can also lead to a fibrosis and the fibrosis tends to be patchy at the top, middle and bottom of the lungs, uh, not just affecting the edges and the bases. And, and, and this condition is often due to inhaled allergens or drugs that you may be taking, or there may not be any known trigger. And finally, just an example of fibrosis due to sarcoidosis. Now sarcoidosis has a number of different patterns in the lungs. It, it typically affects the lymph glands in the middle of your chest, but it can affect your lungs as well. And when it does, it has um, a number of different patterns, it tends to affect the middle part of the lungs and can in some patients lead to fibrosis. And this is an example of, of pulmonary fibrosis here. 
And that's all I've got to show you um, for now. So if you have any questions, please do pop them in the chat box and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Helen. There are some questions for you that you can answer privately if needed. Uh, and thank you for that illustrated, well illustrated presentation. Uh, I'm going to uh, move on. More questions will be answered towards the end of the whole session. I'm going to move on to, uh, uh, sorry, I said Helen, isn't it? It's Erika, thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Helen Parfrey, who's a consultant uh, chest physician ba based at Cambridge, uh, who is leading the Cambridge Institutional Lung Service at um, Royal Papworth Hospital, and is also the lead for the East Anglia ILD network. Uh, she's completed her medical training at uh, Oxford and her PhD from Cambridge and is a C visiting senior research associate at the University of Cambridge and has clinical and lots of research interests in the role of immune response in lung fibrosis and a rheumatoid related ILD. She's also the founding trustee for the Action for IPF and a member of the European Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, over to you, Helen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me to join you today on this really amazing patient day. It's great to see that there are so many hundreds of people who are joining um, this, this session. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about blood tests and the role of genetics in the diagnosis and management of interstitial lung disease. So just really a little bit of background. There are many different types of interstitial lung diseases. Over 200 or so have been described so far. Some of them are more common, like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Some of them are known to have particular associations. And we think of those um, where there may be an occupational associated cause like asbestos um, or coal workers who get coal workers pneumoconiosis. There are also other associated causes with people who have autoimmune diseases, and that encompasses a whole family of conditions from things like rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, myositis, systemic sclerosis and lupus. Um, then there are some more rarer conditions where there may be a familial or an inherited form of your interstitial lung disease some that are associated with um, exposures to um, things that you've been exposed to either in your home or working environment where the lungs become very sensitized to these agents and that results in a condition called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And then there's some very rare conditions, things like alveolar proteinosis and some of the cystic lung diseases. So when we're trying to work out a diagnosis, there's quite a lot of information we need to put together. And what we do is we, as we've already started to, to, to work through this pathway, is that we obviously take um, get some information from you about how you're feeling, what symptoms you have, examine you. We've heard a lot already about the lung function tests and how they can inform things, and the radiology, as, as you've heard already. But sometimes this information isn't sufficient to be able to make a diagnosis. And it's really important that we get the diagnosis as accurate as possible for knowing how the disease is going to behave over time. And more importantly, knowing what the best treatment options available for you. So sometimes we need additional information to be able to do that. And blood tests form part of that additional information. So really there's sort of three broad main reasons why we undertake blood tests and it's not just because doctors like taking blood tests but there is some reason why we do this and I think the main one is really helping us to identify if there's any specific cause or association for the interstitial lung disease. Um, we will also review why sometimes it's helpful to have baseline blood tests because some of the treatments that we use for, for the interstitial lung diseases can affect the blood function or the kidney function or the liver function and we need to know what the baseline levels are as well as monitoring them while you're on treatment. But more importantly it's useful to do these blood tests because it can exclude other causes of breathlessness. And I think one of the other reasons why we sometimes do blood tests is actually to invite you to take part in research programs. And that has really helped enormously in our understanding of lung fibrosis, particularly the genetics that I'll come on to in a minute. 
So if we think first of all about why there are maybe some specific blood tests we can look at to try and see if there's an associational cause for the interstitial lung disease. Um, as I've already mentioned, sometimes interstitial lung diseases can be part of a more um, systemic or widespread disorder called autoimmune diseases. And this is when your immune system starts to um, attack yourself, if you like, and can damage organs within your body, and that's an autoimmune disease. And we're able to assess for that by measuring proteins in the blood that are called antibodies. Now, some of these antibodies are specific to conditions that cause inflammation of your joints, known as an inflammatory arthritis. And for those, we can measure things called rheumatoid factor and an anti-CCP antibody. And they're really quite helpful in terms of diagnosing a rheumatoid arthritis. But there are a whole number of other autoimmune conditions, sometimes called connective tissue disease. And these are the conditions like Sjogren's, lupus, um, myositis, systemic sclerosis, for which we have a different panel of antibodies that we can check. And they are sometimes called an ANA, an ANCA, and a myositis and a sclera Lyme blot. And it's putting that information, those results, with your clinical symptoms that help the rheumatologist determine whether you have an autoimmune disease or not. Other kinds of things that we can measure in the blood go with the condition that we've already heard a little bit about this morning called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And that's where you become exposed to something that you've breathed in all the time and your body becomes sensitized to that. And we can then measure that degree of sensitization on a blood test. And that's called an immunoglobulin or an IgG or sometimes is given the name precipitin. And these are particularly um, important for people who keep birds in the home, particularly parrots, um, but also who either have exposures to molds or fungus in the home or who work in jobs such as farming work um, or um, some agricultural work where there is exposure to environmental molds and fungus. So we can measure precipitins or immunoglobulins to help with that diagnosis. And then some of these interstitial lung diseases, particularly a condition called sarcoid, actually have blood tests which help us with the diagnosis, but also with monitoring how active the disease is. And in sarcoidosis, we can measure two things primarily in the blood. One of them is the calcium level, which can also be measured in the blood and urine. And if the disease is very active, the calcium level can sometimes be elevated. In addition, the inflammatory cells that are associated with sarcoid produce an enzyme called ACE. It's the angiotensin converting enzyme. And again, in some people, if the disease is very active, that enzyme level can be elevated. And we can use that as a way of helping with the right sort of clinical features and radiological features in making the diagnosis. So then the next big group of um, blood tests that we undertake is actually if we're screening for an inherited or a potentially a genetic cause for the interstitial lung disease. And really there's two main groups of patients that we look at doing inherited or genetic screenings for. The first group are families for people who have one or more affected member who have lived or are living with pulmonary fibrosis. And I've shown you here um, an example of the, the, the little figure at the top of the slide um, shows a family tree of one of our families in Cambridge who had pulmonary fibrosis. Now, the, 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 the dark circles and squares are patients who had developed, members of the family who developed pulmonary fibrosis. So you can, in fact, you can see that all the brothers and sisters all developed pulmonary fibrosis. We weren't sure if the parents had pulmonary fibrosis, but we know that one of the children, one of the grandchildren, did have pulmonary fibrosis. And by screening these families, um, initially through research tests, we were able to identify a number of genetic causes for pulmonary fibrosis. Now, some of the genetic conditions are very rare. Um, and as you can see on the figure on the right of your screen, those on the very rare condition are highly likely to cause pulmonary fibrosis. But there's also a group of other genes that are more commonly reported, which have a slightly weaker association with pulmonary fibrosis. And we're now able to screen for about 25 or so of these genetic causes 
for pulmonary fibrosis um, with a genetic test. However, even with this increase in the number of genetic tests that we have available to us, we still know that a large proportion of the genes that cause pulmonary fibrosis still have to be identified. So our current panel allows us to identify about 30% or so of the, of the genetic causes of pulmonary fibrosis. And sometimes these inherited forms of pulmonary fibrosis can occur in people of a very young age at onset, and that can either be in childhood or as a young adult. So they may be the first member of the family to be affected, but because it's happening at a very young age, it makes us highly suspicious that there is a genetic cause for this. And so we're also able to screen these people for the genetic causes of pulmonary fibrosis. As well as pulmonary fibrosis, we've also been able to identify some genes that cause other forms of interstitial lung disease, and they're called the cystic lung diseases. Now, these are very rare, and there's two main groups. One of them um, is a condition called tuberous sclerosis complex, or sometimes in another name of lymphangioliomyomatosis or LAM, which is shortened for. Um, and there are some genetic tests that we can screen for that. And similarly, a very rare condition, again, that causes cysts in the lungs that can be associated with kidney problems called Bert Hogg Dubay syndrome that we can do genetic screens for as well. In terms of other things, as I said, we can do some general um, blood tests to exclude other causes for your symptoms, particularly making sure you're not anemic. Um, and then prior to starting some treatments for um, your interstitial lung disease, whether that's either immunosuppression or antifibrotic therapies, <clears throat> there are a number of blood tests that we can use to do to check your baseline tests are fine before starting these treatments, but then also for monitoring your monitoring for potential side effects while you're on these therapies, the blood tests are taken. And we usually try to work with your general practitioners to have the blood test done locally for you at home for monitoring these medications. So what we've done really is, is add in now how the blood tests. Thank you uh, for that uh, presentation, uh, Helen, uh, despite being unwell, you've given uh, your time to do this. Um, there are some questions that you may be able to answer privately. Uh, I'd be grateful if you could do that. And that makes me uh, uh, invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. William Kent. Dr. Kent is a consultant lung specialist at uh, Liverpool University Hospital, Royal Liverpool site. He runs the interstitial lung disease clinic there. Having qualified in 2005, he's completed a master's in medical sciences and recently uh, a postgraduate certificate in education too. Uh, over to you, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Aravind. Um, so I'm here to talk about some of the investigations that may be helpful in coming to a diagnosis in interstitial lung disease. And this should help to understand some of the medical terms used in the team meeting in the next talk. So bronchoscopy is a common lung procedure that is carried out for many different lung conditions, in particular for infections. Um, and it is a, a small flexible tube that has a camera and a light on it, and it's passed into the airways while the patient is awake, although sedation is given to make them feel very sleepy and local anesthetic is given to to numb the back of the throat this is done as a as a day case procedure in in hospital uh, uh, and the the hollow tube allows samples to be taken so one of the terms you may hear is bronchoalveolar lavage or bal for short and this is where the alveoli or air sacs within the lungs are flushed with salty water. So if you look at the diagram of the lungs, uh, you can see the main airway coming down, splitting into the left and right sides. And then the airways get progressively smaller and you can see the air sacs represented in the circle. So after the water is flushed in, it is then suctioned back through the tubes and the sample sent away to the lab for analysis. Uh, the pathologist can then count the proportion of cells within the sample. 
So depending upon the different proportions of white blood cells that are found, this can be helpful in pointing towards certain disease processes. And this table shows the sorts of results that may occur and how they could guide us uh, to diagnose different lung conditions. If we are unable to come to a diagnosis with the investigations such as scans and blood tests, uh, and it is thought that it would add to management, uh, a biopsy may be considered. Now, this can be done via the bronchoscopy method where a sample of lung tissue is taken via the airways. Uh, one of these techniques is called cryobiopsy, where an area of lung is frozen and removed for analysis under the microscope in, in the laboratory. And now these do have some potential complications associated with them. Uh, and so they aren't undertaken as frequently as some of the other tests that we've already heard about. Um, and without careful consideration of all the information that we have and, and put together. Another method of, um, of obtaining lung tissue uh, is with a small operation carried out by the lung surgeons. Uh, you may hear the term VATS lung biopsy, which stands for video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and essentially means lung surgery carried out with a camera. This, this does require a general anaesthetic where the patient is fully put to sleep and would usually need a three night stay in hospital if it's uncomplicated. Thanks. Sorry, Aravind, I can't, I can't hear you. I think, I think you're on mute, Aravind. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, thank you, Will, for that presentation. I hope, uh, uh, explanation about bronchoscopy is much clearer to our delegates.